my number one complaint that I receive. Guess what? It's bloating. It's the number one complaint of people who walk into the door to see me for. In my opinion, cheese is probably one of the worst foods one could eat. If you're lactose intolerant, I think you're lucky because you end up avoiding dairy as a food group. What's good for the heart is good for the GI tract. What's good for the brain. And it's, it's very cool because you can eat this one diet and it's mostly plant-based and it can help you in with every organ. Hey everyone, this is Jenna Matecki from Plant-Based News. I really hope that you enjoy this video, which is an interview with gastroenterologist, Dr. Angie Sadeghi. If you get something out of this interview, you will definitely get something out of a free Premier Summit linked below. The summit features experts in the fields of lifestyle medicine and conscious living. There's more information about it at the end of this video, but what you need to know in the meantime is that it's completely free and it's accessible by the link in the video description. Anyways, I really hope that you enjoy this interview with Dr. Angie Stegi. The first question that I asked her is, why does she, as a gastroenterologist, recommend a plant-based diet? Enjoy. As a gastroenterologist, I am faced with many patients with many different types of gastrointestinal problems um, that are chronic, debilitating, and quite reversible, and a lot of times preventable. So. The gastrointestinal tract is a very long, torturous tract, mouth, esophagus, stomach, uh, small bowel, and the colon. Um, it also includes the liver and the pancreas. And in synchrony, they work very hard. The GI systems work very hard to digest and absorb food and the nutrients that you consume. Um, if you don't respect the balance and if one eats unhealthy, over time, chronic disease sets in. So the consumption of processed foods, um, animal products, and uh, dairy can cause havoc on the digestion. And um, when done for long periods of time, um, in combination with genetics and some other lifestyle factors like lack of exercise, smoking, and drinking, can, it, it can be a bad deal and it can cause a lot of disease. So as a gastroenterologist on a daily basis, I'm always dealing with so many of these chronic debilitating uh, diseases that could have been prevented and could be reversed given that the patient puts in the time and the effort um, and changing their lifestyle to a better lifestyle in regards to nutrition and fitness and things like that. So it's when you see these debilitating diseases that are quite deadly, like colon cancer, and um, you know, you you see this over and over again, and you you realize after talking to so many people and and looking reflecting back on their lifestyle, you realize how many of these people could have prevented uh, the disease that they're dealing with. You can't help but basically try to change or evolve your practice as a doctor to one that focuses on prevention rather than treatment. And when you reflect back, most of these patients ate a very animal um, predominant diet. So they consumed a lot of processed meat, um, fast food in particular, uh, dairy and meat. Um, most of these patients, if you look back on, on their diet, they, they did not consume a plant predominant diet. Uh, many of these patients um, had a sedentary lifestyle. Many of these patients um, drank a ton of alcohol. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to watch, to watch what's happening to your patients. It's like you're seeing day in and day out, you're, you're seeing these young people in their fifties, you know, to me, that's young now, as I'm <laughs> in my late forties, I look at fifty is nothing. I mean, I'm 47 and that's like three years away. And I'm like, Oh my God, I don't want to be that ill when I'm 50. And be on 20, 30 different medicines, you know? And so what I ask you to do is just eat more plants. So that brings me to your original question. Why are doctors asking their patients to eat more plant-based? Because all of the epidemiological studies on gut health show that if you eat a majority plant-based diet and you eat more fiber, you can prevent colon polyps that uh, can become cancer. You know, you can have a healthier digestive system and you can manage your weight better to have a healthier weight. You can live longer. You can have less uh, heart disease. I mean, it's all, and it goes together. What's good for the heart is good for the GI tract. What's good for the brain. And it's, it's very cool because you can eat this one diet 
and it's mostly plant-based and it can help you in with every organ. So that's why in my clinic, at least as a gastroenterologist, I'm always asking my patients to eat more plants, more fiber. High five. <laughs> can you please give us a children's book version of what happens after I take a bite of an apple versus a bite of cheese? So that, that's a wonderful question because you're looking at a black and white picture with an apple versus a piece of cheese, um, which in my opinion, cheese is probably one of the worst foods one could eat. And an apple is one of the best foods one could eat. So when you look at the com and compare these two foods, when you take a bite of an apple, you're getting a ton of nutrients. You're getting antioxidants, which uh, fight cancer and you get a ton of hydration and my favorite nutrient, which is fiber. <laughs> so uh, as, as the fiber travels through your gut, it encounters uh, the trillions of gut microbiome that live in a symbiotic re relationship in the gut and get a hold of this fiber and ferment it into something called short chain fatty acids, which are literally healing to the gut and fight cancer. So again, you're getting water, you're getting nutrients, antioxidants, and fiber. I can't think of a single bad thing that that apple can do to you. <laughs> Not even one. Let's compare that to the cheese. Cheese is processed, highly processed food. It's got a ton of saturated fat. And that increases your cholesterol in the body, which we all know that we're eating, consuming way too much cholesterol rich foods and foods high in saturated fat that makes make you sick. As that cheese travels through your gut, it, it, it goes into the, in the stomach and hormones are produced such as CCK, uh, it's a very fatty meal. And what happens is um, through a hormonal regulation, the lower esophageal sphincter opens up and allows acid to come up into your esophagus. We have this very commonly found disease called gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. And it's a very common disease that people face. A couple, there's statistics where like three out of five Americans um, experience GERD at some point in their lives. So it's a very debilitating disease and it can be very chronic and cause uh, lead to Barrett's esophagus and cancer. Um, so as that cheese travels through your gut, um, it has a lot of saturated fat, right? Um, there is a talk now, there's some animal studies that show that saturated fat can break the tight junctions between the gut cells and cause what's, so, uh, what's called leaky gut. So again, um, it is definitely not a, a good food to have because it's so full of saturated fat. Um, there are people who are very dairy intolerant and um, they're allergic to the whey and the casein proteins in um, cheese. And that could cause, um, that could wreak havoc on the GI tract. As, as far as um, the allergy is concerned, I have a lot of patients who, uh, who have eosinophilic esophagitis, which is an allergic esophagus. And uh, dairy happens to be one of the commonest causes of um, foods that cause eosinophilic esophagitis. So uh, when I get patients in my clinic with EOE or eosinophilic esophagitis, I always run panels and sure enough, they're allergic to the, the whey or the casein protein in, in cheese. And um, I'm not gonna get into the cardiovascular effects of dairy just because I'm not a cardiologist. However, that saturated fat is terrible for the heart because it increases the cholesterol. And uh, we know cholesterol plaques can clog up the coronary arteries and cause disease. Um, as far as uh, the GI tract is concerned, um, we it, cheese has zero fiber. So people who consume a ton of dairy and meat um, and cheese end up having a ton of uh, problems with constipation. And that's why, you know, those medicines over the counter, the constipation medicines over the counter, it's like a multi-billion dollar industry. There is Senna, which is a stimulant laxative. laxative. There is all kinds of fiber supplements. Uh, there are over the counter Citrusel, Benefiber, Mer um, um, Metamucil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Then there's the osmotic laxatives like Miralax over the counter. There are very strong laxatives like magnesium citrate over the counter. I mean, you have a myriad of all kinds of stimulant, osmotic and um, uh, bulking agents over the counter to treat a problem in America called constipation, which is a huge problem, right? And here we are, we're comparing an apple to cheese and apple can help you move, stimulate uh, the, the bowel. So it can, it can help you with this problem of constipation and you have cheese, which actually clogs you up. So <laughs> there's your comparison. <laughs> okay, then why are so many people turning to yogurt in an effort to try and help their digestive tract? I mean, obviously you're advocating that dairy is a no-go here, yet for many folks, they'll walk into a supermarket and they'll see probiotics and those probiotics are on dairy products in the dairy aisle. Well, first of all, dairy is one of the unhealthiest foods you could consume. So it's like it, eating yogurt for probiotics or calcium is like drinking soda for potassium, in my opinion, because over 65% of the 60% of the population is lactose intolerant. And uh, many people are allergic to the whey and the casein protein. Um, it's got hormones that are not good for you. Um, it's, uh, it's really not health food, although it's sold in the industry as health food, it's not health food. And if you think about how that food was made and brought onto your table, it's absolutely cruel to consume that food. I mean, you have to think about where your food came from. You can't just blindly eat food and not know where it came from. The dairy industry is one of the cruelest industries in the world, and it inflicts a lot of pain and suffering on the animals. And if you're eating that yogurt, you're contributing to that industry and it's wrong. It's a highly subsidized food. So it's dirt cheap just because the government subsidizes dairy and spends millions and billions of dollars. Um, so so what, what the, the farmers are getting all this money um, to, to produce a certain amount of dairy and as the consumption is going down, what they're doing is they're throwing away this milk that was produced. They have to produce a certain amount of milk, right? And they're being subsidized to produce a certain amount of milk. And when that milk is not used because the consumption of milk is going down, people are waking up to the fact that dairy is not health food. It's bad for your digestion. This milk is being discarded and wasted. So, or what they do is they sell it to the, to the fast food industry to put more cheese on your pizza. And it's like, cause it's dirt cheap, right? It's pretty, it's, it's a very cheap food. So a lot of companies are inserting and in a lot of packaged foods and hiding it and you would never know. So I ask my patients to read labels. So anyway, it's a terrible food, but um, why are people, well, it's, it's advertisements for yogurt. It's dairy and in, industry driven, right? I mean, it's not, it's not like it's a, it's a health food and being advocated by doctors and dietitians. It's being advocated by the industry. It's, it's, it's advertising, oh, it's healthy for you. But, but you know, sometimes they don't, they don't always get away with it. Like if you looked at, did you remember the Activia challenge that was taken off air because I, it, it was like being sold as health food for your digestion and it was non-evidence-based so that all of those ads came, came down and, and I haven't seen any of those ads anymore. So probiotics. It turns out that, you know, our gut encompasses 100 trillion um, gut microbiome from mouth to anus. The majority of them live in the colon. And these gut microbiome live in a symbiotic relationship with us and they ferment food and they produce short chain fatty acids and other helpful molecules and vitamins even. So they're really important in our gut health. And so what we should be doing is consume prebiotic rich foods, which is like fiber, which are synthesized or fermented by the gut microbiome to produce the health benefits. Now, what happens if you, if you eat products like foods that have probiotics in them, like the healthy gut microbiome? Um, that live in, in our bodies, what happens if you consume it in the form of a food or a pill? There is no evidence out there that, that, that shows that that causes health. 
So it's, it's, you know, when they advertise yogurt, they say, oh, and it has probiotics, but they never say which will fix your digestion, which will help your digestion. They just say it has probiotics, which is true. It has probiotics. But the same reason I tell my patients do not take probiotics on <laughs> pills, right? There are a lot of probiotics being sold on over the counter for gut health. These are false claims because we don't have evidence that if you take these probiotics that, you know, your gut is going to be healthier. There's, there's one only very small situation, a very small percentage of people um, has science proof that taking probiotics causes gut health. Um, in people who have a pouch after surgery for uh, colitis, okay? So everybody else, like for example, if you had to take, if you had to take amoxicillin for dental work, if you just say, oh, well, I just took this amoxicillin, it's bad for me, so let me go take probiotics to replenish the lost gut microbiome, and therefore I'm going to be healthier, that doesn't work. In fact, studies have shown that uh, perhaps the probiotics that you take in a pill form after antibiotics may cause worsening of the problem and um, prevent the normal flora from coming back to normal, to homeostasis. So, so therefore, I, I want to make it very clear that uh, you can't take probiotics and, um, you know, reverse the side effects of antibiotics or reverse your health problems, whether it's colitis, whether it's gastroesophageal reflux, whether it's SIBO or IBS, it, whatever gut problems you have, probi taking probiotics doesn't help, um, except for that one small percentage of patients that I told you about. So, um, so yeah, if, if you have colitis, ulcerative colitis and patritis, talk to your doctor, but for everyone else, probiotics don't help. So if you want probiotic rich foods, um, it, in my opinion, it's better to eat fermented foods that are dairy free. You know, you could eat kimchi, you could eat, I don't know, you could eat a plant based yogurt. I love yogurt. I eat coconut yogurt all the time. I eat kite hill almond yogurt all the time. So delicious coconut yogurt is the best yogurt in the world. Like, so you can have yogurt. It's just, it's just to me, it's silly to eat uh, Greek yogurt or, uh, or, or dairy based yogurt for the probiotics, which may not even be helping. <laughs> and then you're putting all this poison in your body. Um, uh, which is, it's, it's, it just, yeah, it's so when you listen to advertisements, industry advertisements, you have to look into it further. You have to see where's the science. Um, is it true that yogurt does a digestion good? And, and, and no, it doesn't. <laughs> Thank you for that. Let's talk a little bit about bloating. Seems like we've all experienced it after a heavy meal, but there's also a lot of association between uncomfortable GI symptoms and eating plant-based. For instance, getting bloated after eating some beans. Can we dive into that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So it's interesting because when I was at USC training to be a GI doctor, <laughs> I was dealing with people who are literally on the verge of death, coming in with liver failure, multi-systemic systemic failure in the ICU, intubated, bleeding to death, and people with like, um, you know, colon cancer, obstructed, and all kinds of extreme extremes of what you would see in the hospital. And then when I finished my fellowship and I started my own private practice, my number one complaint that I received. Guess what? It's bloating. It's the number one complaint of people who walk into the door to see me for. It's bloating. So bloating is extremely common. I don't care what diet you're eating. <laughs> I meet people here who eat a whole food plant-based diet. I, eat, I meet uh, people who, eat, who are actually on a very he meat-heavy diet, dairy and meat, and all kinds of processed food. I, I meet people in the in between. I meet people on the keto diets. I mean, a wide variety of diets. But the common denominator is that bloating is a very common symptom, and many people get bloated. When you say bloating, you have to re, you have to differentiate bloating. So there's bloating where you gain weight and you have a lot of subcutaneous fat. And people come to me and they're like, I'm bloated. I mean, I ask questions. They go, yeah, well, I've, I've put on 20 pounds in the last six months or one year. And look at me, I'm bloated. And when I ask them questions, I realize that by bloat, they mean that they've gained weight. And it's stuck there. It doesn't go anywhere. doesn't matter if you eat or you don't eat. You're going to have bloat. That's not bloating. That's subcutaneous fat. 
you see. Um, then you have other people who have actual fluid inside their belly that's called ascites. They also call that bloating. They come in and they go, I am bloated. And you look at their um, exam and they have liver failure and there's bloating and it's ascites inside their belly. And that also manifests as bloating. So that's also needs to be considered. Um, so then you have the people who have um, actual abdominal distension and bloating due to gas. When you eat food, um, there is um, the fermentation process that produces gases and you can get a little bit of abdominal distension from the gases that are being produced as the result of fermentation. Okay. That's also bloating usually comes and goes, you wake up with a flat stomach and then you eat and you, you get bloated because there's fermentation. There's another type of bloating and distension where uh, people with IBS uh, feel, and it's not necessarily gas, and it's not necessarily necessarily accumulation of gas. It's just the feeling of bloating and distension. And when they show you their belly, it's a little bit distended, but it's not to the extreme that they feel. So they feel like their belly is bloated at 10 out of 10, and they have IBS, and their the, their nervous system works differently for them than normal people. So um, people without IBS, so they have this feeling of really bloat distension, but when you look at it, it's not really hugely distended or bloated. It's just the feeling they get. And, and this happen, uh, this happens to be very common. So if you take a group of people with um, IBS and a group of people without IBS, and you uh, put a certain amount of air in both uh, groups, people without IBS would be okay and comfortable and would handle that air distension just fine. But if you put that same amount of air in people with IBS, suddenly they're miserable and they're very irritated and they're, they're in pain. So it's the same amount of air in both groups, but the IBS group have an exaggerated response. And it's, it's, it's just basically, it's their nervous system handling that distension. So, um, you know, so this is a common problem that I see in my uh, clinic in patients with IBS. Um, there's another uh, form of bloating that comes from abdominal distension due to the gases that are being produced due to a disease called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO, where there's a, um, an overload of bacteria in the small bowel where it doesn't belong. So as the food travels, there's fermentation of the food and the bacteria are producing a ton of um, hydrogen gas and methane gas, which you can test for with a breath test. And, and this extra gas production can uh, produce belching, burping, flatulence, and distension um, and discomfort. And there's another type of bloating. It's when you eat, your stomach stretches. I mean, who doesn't get that? <laughs> Especially if you have to eat, you eat a big meal. So like you said, almost every single person in this world has felt bloated at some point in their lives and will have bloating at some point in their lives. Now, what happens if you eat these quote unquote gassy foods? <laughs> well, foods aren't gassy, we are. <laughs> and it's interesting because, you know, same, uh, these gassy foods, like for example, uh, cauliflower or beans uh, get a bad rep because I mean, they're fermentable fibers. They, um, they get fermented in the gut and there's a production of uh, some gas, but it's, it's, it depends on how your body handles it. Like, I could eat a ton of beans and I don't get bloated just because my body, I don't have IBS. So the way my body handles the beans is different from someone with IBS. So with people who have severe IBS, um, what I would re recommend is, is start small and increase it slowly. And there is sometimes there's that um, slow start and oh, increasing the food over time, somehow your body can get used to it a little bit better and it, you can, uh, you, you will adjust to it somehow. I mean, I used to get super bloated from it too, but I don't anymore. I could, it could be because we don't have any randomized control studies on this. Okay. So, but for the most part, most people would agree that if you start um, eating small and just slowly increase the amount, your body will get adjusted to it. So Bloating is a common complaint, number one. There are a ton of reasons why you would get bloated. If you get bloated, talk to a gastroenterologist, a board certified gastroenterologist who understands how to treat you and diagnose you. And um, my suggestion is don't worry about it. If you're getting a little bloated eating these quote unquote gassy foods, which are fermentable fibers, they're healthy for you. You get a little gas, but guess what? That food, that's that fiber-rich food is being fermented in your gut, producing short-chain fatty acids. So maybe it's not such a bad thing that you may have a little bit more gas. It's good for you. <laughs> so we're pro farts. 
<laughs> Farts are good. <laughs> so many people think that they have stomachs of steel. Like those people that can just say, listen, I can handle anything that you can put into me. Have you heard that before? And what's your response to that? You know, um, that's a, that's a very good um, good thing to bring up. And actually, a lot of people say that. And and like I personally have a stomach of steel. Like it's just it's it's awesome because I could eat anything, and I never had GI problems except for constipation. I did have constipation, but I never had these like problems that people have. But you know, and I was eating dairy. But the thing is that. Um, if your digestion is robust and you're not getting the deleterious effects of all these bad foods that you're eating, it doesn't mean that you're not um, getting disease. You're still getting disease that's not being manifested as diarrhea and abdominal pain, nausea or vomiting. And so you think, oh, I'm spared. It definitely doesn't make you sp spared from uh, getting disease. So you can still uh, produce colon polyps that become cancer. You can still produce stomach um, cancer. You can down the line um, have problems, but you know, dairy, for example, is 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 an unhealthy food group. And the thing is that the lactose intolerance is very common, but some people don't have lactose intolerance, right? So they can eat it and not have any problems. So you know, you you have to realize that you may not have those over GI problems. In fact, if you're lactose intolerant, I think you're lucky because you end up avoiding dairy as a food group because when you eat it, you get a really terrible response. So if you're lactose intolerant, you may um, stop eating it just because you're not feeling well, and that'll serve you in the long run. So yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. I have a stomach of steel. I can eat anything. Mm, I can have a pint of ice cream. It's going to be fine. Right. Well, and then two, 20 years later, they have cancer and it's like your stomach of steel is not working. <laughs> I mean, you know, you go with these populational studies, people who eat that way, they get heart disease, they have heart attacks, they have colon cancer, they have breast cancer. I mean, that's the problem is if you don't feel badly and you continue eating it, that's when you run into problems because then you get this these chronic diseases that most Americans die from, right? Like there is, it's not a secret, like our 50 year olds are really ill in this country and 50 is not that old. Like people should not be so ill at age 50. So they had stomachs of steel and they ate crappy, right? And that doesn't prevent them from getting disease. So disease sets in. So when you're in college and, you know, in your thirties, forties, the coronary artery disease is um, building up, your um, polyps are building up, and then you turn 50 and it gets to that tipping point where you're like having symptoms as the results of as a result of eating all these bad foods that didn't bother you acutely during the years over the last 20 years, you have a stomach of steel. Yeah. So eat crappy, no problem. And then you're 50 and then suddenly you have a heart attack. Suddenly you're diagnosed with cancer because diseases are asymptomatic for so long. And people don't understand that being asymptomatic doesn't mean that you're healthy. <laughs> yeah. So I guess for some people they can trust their gut, but then there's also some people who should just not <laughs> you can't really trust your gut to be honest with you <laughs> Wait, what? You know, like yeah because i mean if trusting your gut means um, you know eat cookies all day you know because that's t tasty <laughs> okay so don't trust your gut support your gut eat healthy for your gut eat healthy for your gut and for the rest of your body uh Trusting your gut would be like, ooh, that ice cream looks good. Let's have it every day. <laughs> That's what my gut wants, to eat like as many sweetened and salty, oily foods as possible. I'm not sure that's a good idea. <laughs> if someone were to ask me, how is your gut health? I think I would be like, oh, yeah, you know, I think it's pretty good. But then the first thing that I would think about is poop. <laughs> what should we know about poop? So, so, so here's the thing. Um, when when you have healthy a healthy stool, that's great, fantastic. But it doesn't tell you that your digestion is necessarily 100% healthy, because you could be eating meat, processed meat, and dairy, and a ton of red meat, and not enough fiber, and still have healthy poops. But it does not um, guarantee that you're not going to have polyps, or um, you know. Uh, 
be prone to cancer. So you could still have healthy poops and, and, and be ill because your body is uh, being exposed to a lot of toxins and it's producing polyps in your colon, which is a, uh, which colon cancer is a huge problem in this country. So we have to address it. We can't ignore the fact that colon cancer is a huge problem and it kills hundreds of thousands of people, um, um, in America. And so, um, and, and, Colon cancer comes from polyps, which are abnormal growths that are asymptomatic for years, for like 10, 15 years, these polyps are asymptomatic. So you could be eating really unhealthy and your poops look per perfectly normal, which I'll tell you what that is. But anyway, you could have perfectly healthy poops and you're developing these polyps that predispose you to cancer. So just remember that polyps are asymptomatic and you don't always, and or stomach cancer even, you could have, um, you could be eating processed uh, foods and, and have the um, start of stomach cancer and be totally asymptomatic for years. And so when you do become symptomatic, it's too late, right? So keep that in mind as you're, if you're listening and you're like, well, my poops are great. And so, you know, I'm good, right? No. So just still, just remember, you should eat a, a, a predominantly he healthy, whole food plant based diet. But okay, but what is considered a normal stool? Um, there's actually a stool chart. It's called the Bristol scale st stool chart. And you can download it on the, off the internet or just Google it and it'll pop up, pop right up. But um, generally speaking, there's type one, two, three stools that are hard, bulky and dry and dehydrated, hard to evacuate. And they're painful to evacuate. You have to strain a lot. Um, the number one is like rabbit pellets, really hard. Number two is like sausage shape, but it's very hard and bulky and cracked. And number three is um, a little bit better than number two, but it's still hard. Type four stools are generally accepted as the normal stool. They look like a sausage or a snake, if you will. Um, it's a long piece of formed stool. So formed stool is normal. Formed stool, it's not cracked, it's not dry. It looks like a sausage and it's easy to evacuate. And um, it comes out and you have a feeling of complete evacuation. It doesn't, it's not associated with urgency and pain. Okay, so that's a type four stool. And then type, uh, type five, six are loose stools, um, which are basically, um, or seven, type uh, five, six, seven are loose stools. And the seven being the extreme side of the spectrum, which is watery, completely watery. And then um, five and six are fluffy and they disintegrate when it comes out into the toilet bowl. It's usually um, people have a feeling of urgency and incomplete evacuation. <laughs> For some people, learning that plant-based eating is the way to go, initially it can be kind of seen as a bummer because they're new to it and they don't really know what their options and alternatives are. How can plant-based eating be fun? You know, eating plant-based uh, is fun for me and for a lot of my friends who've been immersed in this lifestyle long enough. So people who start at first, they don't know what to do and they don't know what to eat and it can be daunting and it can be almost a job figuring out, oh my God, what do I eat? <laughs> but it's so much fun because, you know, you're exposed to so many different um, food groups that you never even imagined. Like, you may be surprised, I don't know uh, about you, but like, for me, you may find this as a surprise. I didn't even know what quinoa is before I became plant-based. I didn't know, uh, there. there's a tofu, tempeh, I'd never heard of tempeh. Like, it's really cool because you, you end up, introducing new things into your diet that you had never imagined. And it becomes fun because you explore new things. Like even I still uh, have fun exploring new cheeses that come on the market or new yogurts that come on the market. Oh, new burgers that come on the market. You know, my suggestion is um, for anyone who wants to eat more plant-based, don't worry about perfection. Don't worry about no oil, no sugar, no uh, salt. It's just about eat more plants. Eat mostly whole foods. It's okay if you eat a vegan brownie for God's sakes once in a while. You don't have to be perfect. Eat your ice cream once in a while. Eat your plant-based ice cream. So delicious, makes the most delicious ice cream in the world, I think. You know, so just have fun with it. Eat the same like fun things that you were enjoying before and don't try to be so strict where you're not eating any sugar at all and or any um, oil at all. Like it's okay, have some olive oil in, in your in your diet. You know, when I first started, I didn't do that. I ate zero oil and I honestly took the fun away. So now I put olive oil on my food. I do eat a little bit of um, 
avocado oil if I ever fried my tofu and it's delicious and I enjoy it. So I, I don't think it should be about perfection. Make it fun. Eat fun things. If, if cookies are fun for you, eat that once in a while, for God's sakes, you'll be fine. It's people who eat junk food every day on a regular basis are the ones who get themselves into trouble health-wise. If you're eating, um, for example, I don't know, um, a vegan cookie once every month and or a vegan ice cream once in a month, it's very unlikely that you would have health problems if the majority of the time you're eating healthy uh, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, grains, and legumes. And to make it fun, if you like cooking, I think, you know, download a ton of recipes on, on the internet because there are so many talented chefs out there nowadays and talented dietitians who are basically putting together healthy, fun recipes. And I'm not a co good cook at all. I can't even warm water, but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, if you like enjoy, many people enjoy cooking, right? If you enjoy that, make it fun. Download all these yummy recipes and try different recipes. Try to incorporate foods that you've never had in your life and diversify your diet. You know, when when I was uh, when I was in vegan, I had such a boring diet. I had, you know, burgers and pizza and ice cream. Okay, three food types like almost every day. Now I'm eating a variety of foods. Uh, Two hundred fifty vegetables to choose from at the store, like a hundred fruits to choose from at the store, different types of beans, different types of um, uh, foods, like vegan foods on the market, like, like veg veggie burgers, all kinds of stuff. So I just feel like you diversify your food. It automatically becomes fun. Um, but to start, I would say like, just slowly get into it and hang out with people who are vegan. It's really important <laughs> because they show you the yummy restaurants and the foods. And it's just important um, to follow accounts like vegan accounts on, on Instagram. Then you, you realize that it's, it's, it's fun. <laughs> what would you like to eat later today? A vegan, huge vegan burrito. <laughs> <laughs> um, so later today, I think what I'm going to eat is I'm going to empty a can of black beans. I'm not a good cook. Remember that. So I'm not, I don't put together any complicated recipes. It has to encompass only a few ingredients and doesn't require cooking. <laughs> so I would have, um, black beans inside my burrito with chopped avocados, chopped onions, chopped tomatoes, and, um, the bitchin sauce which is yummy. If you haven't had the bitchin sauce, you should. <laughs> bitchin sauce? Oh my God, you've never had it? It's got the bitchin sauce. It's to die for. It's so good. There's different flavors. I like the jalapeno one. And um, I think it's sold out of Costco, Trader Joe's, and you can order it online. Oh my God. It's, you can have hay and put bitchin sauce on it. It'll taste good. <laughs> Well, luckily, a whole foods plant-based diet does not have hay in it. <laughs> no, imagine that. So you have this these yummy fresh ingredients and a little bit of bitchin sauce, you're set. <laughs> the global pandemic has changed our world forever. Millions of lives have been lost, and tragically, it's not over yet. And here's something that's really kind of important. Some of the biggest COVID-19 risk factors are what's called comorbidities. These include obesity, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, and other chronic illnesses. And the good news here is that whether or not you ever get COVID-19, the food you eat and the choices you make today have the power to shape your destiny and your health for the rest of your life. Right now, it's more important than ever to clean up your diet, to eat the foods that support your immune system, Scientific studies show us that eating the right foods can help you prevent and even reverse cancer, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune conditions, obesity, can help prevent Alzheimer's. And these foods really are your number one way to strengthen your heart, your brain, your microbiome, and your immune system. They can help you to have lasting energy, more satisfying sleep, and to set you up for a long, happy life. I'm Ocean Robbins, host of the Food Revolution Summit. And I want you to know the truth about your food. That's why my dad and colleague, two million copy best-selling author, John Robbins and I, have teamed up with 24 of the world's most brilliant revolutionary experts to bring you this year's biggest breakthroughs in food and health. And because this information is so important, 
right now more than ever before, we're offering it to you completely for free. In this, the 10th Anniversary Food Revolution Summit, you will find out what's really going on behind the scenes in our food system. You'll find out which foods you need to avoid and what the leading edge of medical science is discovering about how you can optimize your immune health, your brain health, and your heart health. Most importantly, you're gonna find hope for your future and real, actionable, scientifically grounded solutions that can improve your life and your world starting today. I can't wait to share it all with you. Remember, it's completely free. So go ahead and sign up right on this page. All you need to do is enter your name and email to reserve your spot right now. And I'll see you in the summit.